Welcome to the Business Performance Podcast, where we feature expert thought leaders and cover their best strategies, stories, and advice that you can use to successfully mature your own business performance. Now, here is your host, business coach, Henry Schneider. Hello, everyone. This is Henry Schneider with the Business Performance Podcast. And today, it's my pleasure to talk with Rick West, a field agent. And this is a company that does uses crowdsourcing to help gather marketing information for their clients. So Rick, welcome to the podcast. And Henry, thanks for having me. So to begin with, could you briefly describe Field Agent, who your typical customers are, and really what your products and services are that support them? Sure, you know, you know Henry, we look at this as uh, we're, we're an on-demand platform. Uh, and so we take clients that need a task completed uh, at any given time, and we connect it with people trying to make a little bit more money. And so uh, we do data collection work that can be an audit or research or kind of a, a customer experience, Mr. Shopping kind of effect. Uh, we also do marketing work. And that marketing work would be you know, buying and trying products or engaging products, almost like, a, uh, like an everyday influencer. And we do some basic tasks, um, do a lot of retail, quick serve restaurants, real estate. Uh, so basically anything that has a location and you need information or a small task completed, that's what we do from a B2B standpoint. So what we're not is a platform. So we're not going to mow your grass and wash your dishes, uh, but we are going to collect data for you and complete some basic tasks from a B2B standpoint. Okay. So what size are your typical clients? Yeah. So clients for us, uh, think of the, uh, the bell curve of life, right? So on that upper end of the bell curve, uh, we're going to have, you know, fortune one, fortune five, fortune 20, those clients, so it's the p and Unilever's, Walmart to the world that do work with us. Uh, and they're going to do, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars for projects because they need scale. I need 10,000 locations, 20,000 locations. Um, we have quick serve restaurants like a Wendy's or uh, a Yum Brands that are engaging us as well. The big middle are a lot of everyday folks that may have small brands or, or small companies. And that small company might be a $100 million, $200 million company. Uh, that needs work done, and they're engaging us all the way to the individual that says, hey, I just want to swipe a credit card, do a DIY, and I need one location checked uh, because I'm following up on a contractor that was supposed to do work for me. So we really can handle one transactions at a time, DIY, all the way up to tens of thousands of transactions at a given time. So that's kind of the logo part for us. Uh, we're here in the United States and seven other countries, so we have a global footprint. Uh, we can track information across uh, countries where it makes sense, and that's kind of the work that we do. Okay, so I've, I've looked at your application, and I saw some jobs. Okay. One of them was to go to a doctor's office to make sure they had a specific magazine there. How does that yeah. work? Yeah, so, so think of it in terms of uh, you know, company A is paying significant dollars to ensure that a distribution happens, and a distribution could be a magazine in that case. Uh, it could be uh, marketing materials that should be up. And so what we do is post that information out and say, hey, Henry, while you're out today, if you're near this doctor's office or you're going to this location or you're going to be at this event, would you like to make a few extra dollars while you're there? And you're like, well, sure, I was already there. Why not make a few dollars? So that's the concept of crowdsourcing that comes in. Okay. Uh, and then what happens, our clients then take that information and they're not paying hundreds of dollars to send a contractor 200 miles to go check. They're paying tens of dollars to ensure that an everyday person can go check. We keep the information, get it back to our client. And our client says, hey, you check 10,000 locations. I've got a problem in 10% of those. Then they send more high labor licensed people out to go fix or resolve some issues or go back and work with their third party. Okay. And the other question I had is that you also have some kind of uh, recycling audit where you look at the, the cardboard and the mixed recycle stuff bundled. How does that work? Listen, that is everyone's favorite jobs. So I would never tell you when to check your phone, but I would tell you I would check early on a Sunday. Uh, so what we do um, in that particular audit of, of, uh, of capturing um, corrugated bales behind of a, a retailer, uh, that retailer needs to understand the number of pallets of, of corrugate behind the, the warehouse. Uh, you literally can drive in your car, roll down your window and take a photo, never get out of your car and make money. Mm -hmm. That's how crazy this is, right? Now, there's other things that require you to engage, right? You have to go into a, um, let's say you're going into a Little Caesars pizza. 
You have to order the pizza. You have to order what we're asking you to order and you have to receive it and you have to eat it. But the good news is, Henry, I'm giving you a free pizza and I'm paying you to buy the pizza. Uh, I think in the next couple of months, we'll probably give away, you know, 10,000 beers because we are checking on premise locations for beer on tap and for beer that's going to be served a certain way. So those are the kind of fun things that people get while you're out and about pizza and beer. Henry, who wouldn't want that? Yeah. Uh, and then you get the basic audience that says, I don't want to leave my car. We can take care of you too. So we do literally hundreds of thousands of location-based audits, research, mystery shopping, and marketing tasks every single month. Okay, great. So now taking all that into context, what's the importance of the quality of this information to your clients? So think about from a quality standpoint, uh, this isn't just a fun way to go take a photo. Uh, we have some clients that have our data that are connected via API. So in other words, they'll send us a transaction, say, go complete this. We send the transaction back in. It goes right into the dashboard. So if we don't do an amazing quality QC job to ensure the data is accurate, then our clients can't make decisions. Uh, so it's not like take 500 pictures, what do you think? It's 500 very specific photos with data elements of those photos so that I can make a business decision. So, you know, we tell our clients, and this is true, that from AI, you know, redundancy, QC, and human eyes on photos and data, every single piece of data you get back is QC'd. It's 100% it's quality. Uh, we always ensure that so you can make business decisions on the fly. And that data comes back to you in hours and days versus weeks and months. Okay. So when you get a photograph of like something on a store shelf or those bales, um, what are you looking for in terms of the quality to make certain it's good enough to give back to your client? Yes, yeah, so let's use shelf versus bales, two great examples. Uh, the bales would be if I take a picture of 10 pallets, uh, I primarily use that photo to ensure that when you told me there were 10, I'm spot checking to make sure there's 10. So Henry, we're keeping honest people honest. Okay. Right. You swing in, you say there's 10, you really didn't count. There were eight. You know, I am actually checking that photo. Okay. So I, truth be, it's not just out there for fun. Yeah. I'm QCing the photo. The second piece of that is if I'm going into a shelf as an example, and I take a photo of a shelf, I might want to know what's out of stock on that shelf. So I can, because of the way the iPhones and Android phones work today, I can zoom in with the megapixels on that photo. I can zoom into the tag. And via microtask and other processes we have, I can now tell you the exact UPC that was out of stock on that shelf. So a photo of 50 items and I see five holes, I can tell you with one photo, five out of stock. So in this case, a photo really does, you know, it makes for 100 words, right? It really does give me a tremendous amount of data. Okay. I then take that information, provide it back to my client. That's opposed to sending someone in with a clipboard, writing down all of these transactions. So Speed is there. Now, in both those cases, what's also interesting, you know, think about you making a business decision. You go to your third party and the third party says, no, Henry, you're wrong. There were only two out of stocks. And you said, no, here's the photo. Well, as my old football coach told me when I would, you know, do something on the field, Rick, be careful what you tell me because the magic eye in the sky don't lie. Yeah. So those photos are tremendous, tremendous from a QC standpoint to get you great data. It's really important as you hold employees, W-2, contractors, and third parties uh, accountable because the photos don't lie. Okay, so Rick, do you actually manually check those photos or are you using technology for that? Let's say yes, yes, and yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are some things that technology does a really good job with, as you can imagine. Uh, how many bells or how many, you, you, you can visually check on things, right? Tell where things are. There are other things that are if this, then that. And you simply can't, by the time the AI catches up and you do photo recognition on that, uh, you need two or 3,000 transactions and the transactions are all over. So by the time you teach it, it's hard for AI to do it. Now, there's some things that we do in a repetition that AI is pretty good and it really goes through and we can spot check. But in most cases, uh, we either use our microtasking process or our own QC people to go in. AI summarizes, puts things together. But it still requires human eye to really take a look at it. I'd love to tell you, Henry, that it was you throw it into a system and it spits out all these answers. Uh, but as you can imagine, going into retail as an example or going into uh, Wendy's, you think they're all the same, but they're really all different. 
And so it's hard to train AI to go do that. Okay, so if you got a you got somebody out there you doing a job for you, uh, under what circumstances would you reject what they turn in? Yeah, if, if you go to 20 different websites that talk about our company, the number one complaint, hmm. followed quickly by the number two complaint, the number one complaint is, I wish there were more things to do. Give me more work, give me more work. The, this close second is, you guys ripped me off because you should have paid me $2 and I took that photo and it was the right photo. Well, Henry, we're, we're pretty rigid because it's not just an interesting photo. Someone's making a business decision. They're going to spend real dollars on that. So when I tell you to go to a location and show everything and you show half, I can't use the photo. Hmm. If I tell you to take a picture of a shelf at the store and you leave off the top row, I can't use that photo. Now, what's also important to note is we're not trying to use half of the photo to process something. We quickly say, no, Henry, here's what you did wrong. We give you feedback, but as we're doing that, we immediately push that job back out again and someone else is pulling that data back in. So if it's not a quality photo, we don't use it, okay. but we also try to give you feedback to understand it. And I want most of the agents that do our work, the ones that have been doing you know, thousands of dollars for us, get it. Uh, the rigidity is there because the quality requirements for our clients. That's completely understandable. So let's say, for example, you go into the grocery store where there's not a lot of open space, and you may not get right. the entire shelf with a landscape picture. Do you do right. it one shot at it, or can you give multiple photographs? Uh, you do multiple fo photographs. Yeah, so we'll, in many cases, because of the resolution required, we'll tell you to give me a third, a third, a third. And because of AI, we can actually stitch those together. So we have technology allows it to stitch to go do it. In most cases, the, the most common instance where someone's, you know, messing up, if you will, is, is we're saying, hey, I need to have all four corners of this. And you say, oh, well, you're talking about this item. And they zoom in and take a picture of the item. You said, yeah, it was a great photo of the item. But what they didn't realize was I also needed to know adjacencies. Yeah, right. So while I ask you for a picture of the downy, I really needed to know adjacencies as well. You say, I gave you a great picture of the downy. You said, but Henry, I needed a picture of everything. And then they're like, well, yeah, I understand that, but it's still not fair. It was still a great photo. I said, yeah, but I was going to pull data from the sides. And I don't tell you that because I'm not trying to give you 20 things. I just need a great photo. Mm -hmm. And so imagine in your, your business world as you go through things, Everyone is trying to predict what I need as opposed to doing what I told them to do. Sure. I did what Rick really wants is this. So this, I'll give it, he'll be so much happier if I zoom in. You're like, oh, don't zoom in. Yeah. I, I need this for a reason. And so that's the normal issue. People are like, oh, you really just want what you ask for. And the answer, Henry, is yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Rick, I can completely understand it because if the item is in the bottom shelf and you just right. zoom in and you don't know where it is placed since it's in the middle. And the stuff in the bottom shelf doesn't sell because you got to get down on the floor and look in there. Right, right. And then I ask you to take a photo, and you go down to the bottom shelf and take a picture, and you zoom in. I can't tell if it's in the top shelf or middle shelf. I don't know where it is. You're excited because you gave me better than what I asked for. You zoomed in and gave me a great photo. I'm like, no, 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 no. I, I needed to have the whole thing. Now, eventually, people that do work with us get it. Hey, read the instructions. Pretty straightforward. Take a photo. Don't overthink it. <laughs> walk away get paid the money, and everyone's really happy. Okay. All right. So now, um, what are one or two of the basic misconceptions out there when it comes to what you're trying to provide to your clients? Yeah. So from a, I, let's take it from a client standpoint, an agent standpoint. A misconception of, a, of the client would be, oh, you guys just do audits. What's really, really interesting in our work, Henry, is because we have everyday shoppers, uh, not only can I take a picture of the shelf that shows baby food, but instead of asking Rick or Henry to take that photo, I'm going to ask a mother of two that has two children eating baby food to take that photo. So now you know what happens? That photo gets really, really smart. Henry, <laughs> because now that mother of two is only taking a great photo to tell me what the price was and what it looked like. She's now giving me her opinion mm -hmm. as to what she thought about the price what item would she purchase? If the item wasn't in stock, would she purchase something different? Then what's also interesting is, well, I've got that mother in the store. So, hey, while you're there, why don't you go talk to the employee or associate and tell them you're interested in buying a supplement for this. 
a substitute for this. What do you suggest? So now I'm doing mystery shopping. Mm -hmm. Well, hey, well, while you're there, could you go by the restroom and tell me if you think the changing table's dirty? Now I've got customer experience. I didn't take that a little bit further and say, hey, would you buy this, take it home and try it, and tell me what you think? Now I've got an in-home use test. Well, while you've tried it, could you tell me a story? And then I published that story, uh, and now I've got an everyday influencer showing, telling me the story. So the misconception that people have because of our scale is that you guys are the audit guys. What you don't understand with the 1.5 million downloads just in the United States alone, we look at our demographics, my photos are really smart and they're really insightful and they create an amazing story for our clients. So the clients that get it, take us all the way soup to nuts. There are others that are still transactional and that's okay, Henry. But the wealth of knowledge and data that we can put against the photo is, is breathtaking sometimes. Yeah. Well, I saw a video on your site, I guess where um, one of the, uh, your clients was concerned about the price of milk and you got this big map, right. with prices all over the place. Right, right. So, so think of an interesting concept there. You, um, you're client A, and you have a, a, a retailer that calls you and says, Henry, I've got a problem. My competitive retailer has taken the price of this from $2 down to $1. I've got a system-wide issue. I need you to mark down all your items in every store because these guys have gone rogue. And you're like, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. In a matter of hours, field agent can tell you, which is what that story was showing, yeah. is that of the 20, 30 stores in a market, there was one rogue store manager. Mm. Don't panic. It was a rogue and it saved that person thousands and thousands of dollars of markdown because they didn't have to appease the buyer and say yes. They actually had data and the buyer went, oh, okay, I, I know what field agent is. You've got the data. You get a pass on this one. And we've done that timeless times, Henry. I'm going out checking markets because you've got a rogue out of here or there. And we give truth. You may think one thing is happening, but when I give you thousands of locations, you're like, oh, 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 okay. Truth makes sense. Yeah, yeah. The data don't lie. So it doesn't lie. It has a story, but it doesn't lie. Yeah. Okay. So what's the biggest challenge that field agent is facing with business performance today? <clears throat> yeah, I, I think for us, it's, um, you know, we do a great job of solving the issue of quick, fast data. It just it comes in very, very quickly. I think that the, the thing that people are asking yesterday really gets into that shelf example that I gave you. It's, hey, while I've got this photo here, how do I mine and get more data and more data and more data from that? And the problem is, to be honest with you, it's a black hole. So the biggest challenge we have is to be able to subgroup requests or subgroup kind of the knowledge or data you can take from photos and other information to make it more user friendly and to create products from that. Because the problem is I could do a hundred things with it. Well, that's just, it's just too broad, right? So for us is getting really, really tight, honing in on those products. So that's challenge A. The other challenge is, is that times, again, most people would, would laugh at this, but it's so true. Sometimes we give too much data because it's so much and it's so quick. We've had some quick serve restaurants saying, I know you can give me mystery shop data this afternoon based on what happened today at lunch. My normal mystery shopping data comes to me 30 days late and a nice report. I said, yeah, but you can't react to that because half of your employees have already left. You've already had churn. What if I gave you data at the store level so the store manager could have an afternoon meeting that talked about five people that were shopping at your restaurant today and gave you feedback that said, I, uh, I, I don't think I can handle it. It's mm -hmm. too fast. So we're kind of ahead of the curve and pushing data in near real time. And there are clients with traditional systems that are saying, I just, I can't swap, I can't consume that. And so that's a challenge for us because we'd like to push faster. They said, Rick, I can't consume it because then tomorrow you're giving me more data and I, I just can't go do that. Uh, so that's been fun. It's been a fun challenge for us, Henry, but it's a real issue with data. Are, when you do, are you doing data analytics and providing like a dashboard report back or are you just giving the data? Uh, we, we do. So uh, we do kind of soup to nuts. In most cases, our clients are going to ask us to program, build a project for them, give them great quality data. It goes right into a dashboard and they're really, really happy. They can download that to a CSV file, an SPSS file process the data, really, really happy. There are some clients that would say, hey, I don't have time to do that. 
you know, because I have a real job. I need you guys to give me a summary report. So we do a ton of summary reports. There are other clients that are coming in and said, listen, I want to do this monthly. You guys are involved in this data. Would you help put together kind of an analytic dashboard? And with that, we can pull things out. Some clients use Tableau as an example. We can pull out and create a very, you know, unique Tableau report for them and to get it where it's operational and up and running. So there are some clients that have us go all the way to the point where we're kind of spoon feeding data. But the big middle for us is fast, actionable data that goes into a dashboard that you can drill down in very quickly and get near real-time results. Okay, cool. So um, the, um, what are some of the fears, the most common fears then with um, the companies have when they're coming to you? Yeah, I, I think in most cases, uh, bell curve guys so the bell yeah. curve right the, yeah. the extreme fear on one side would be uh, i don't know what i don't know and i'm hearing this either from my my buyer or my competitor or my boss and the fear is i just need you guys to to save me like can you just make sure that things are okay it's just really that i, I just need to make sure things are okay that's kind of the fear the other fear is um and i'll say this in a nice way maybe i don't want to know what you're going to tell me uh -huh. oh, yeah. You're an agency and you've been doing work for years and every piece of data that you have says that you're 90% accurate or 95% accurate. And I come in and tell you you're 60. Well, maybe you don't want to know that. Yeah. So there are some times that we're, we're engaging with clients, especially with other agencies involved. Uh, and Henry, to be honest with you, we're kind of like their worst nightmare because I'm, I'm agnostic. I, I, I'm just giving you data. Right. And they're saying, ooh, if I get that data, now I have to go show someone, I, now that I've got it, I have knowledge and I have to do something with it. So there are some folks that simply don't want to know and there are others saying, I need to know uh, and have to go do that. So those are kind of extremes. Yeah, yeah, don't confuse me with the facts. <laughs> well, but, but you know, in, in all honesty, again, we can be a little bit cynical here because your readers will, your listeners will appreciate this, right? That um, my opinion, I have no data to support this, but this is my opinion, is that, uh, when you ask someone to self audit, it's always a solid 95, 96% accurate. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like when you cheat on the test, you're smart enough not to do 100, but you're not going to give yourself a C. Yeah. And so we tell people is that we keep honest people honest, Henry. Mm -hmm. I'm not out to get anyone. And so of the big scale, you've got 5,000 locations. You know the 20, 30% of locations you're questionable. Let us go help keep those people honest because you know the other 80% that do a great job, don't check them. They're great. Yeah. You know. I'm like, well, I don't know, but when you sum it all up, we're doing a pretty good job. And that's that fear is that I, I now uncover the 20, 30 percent that are a problem. So Henry, what do you have to do now? Now you gotta go fix it. Now you have to go resolve it. And, and there there's a group of people, it's like, man, life's pretty good. I, I really don't want to jump into that. So those are the the fears and the balances that we see oftentimes. Yeah. So how do you get people past those fears then? <clears throat> Well, the, the point for us is we have an ROI conversation, is that I know what you're saying is heavy lifting over here. Let's not try to talk about all 5,000. Just give us one market, one district. Give us your third party. Let us work with them. Let's help them get better. And if you can get someone, Henry, that truly understands ROI and understands that this really can work and it's not overwhelming, it's a really interesting relationship because you start to work with it, realize we're not the bad guys. We're just trying to help out. And we're not trying to get someone a bad report card. We're trying to help solve a problem. That's when everyone can breathe a little better. And we've had some interesting conversations with folks and just helped them get better. Okay, wonderful. So um, <clears throat> what, are there any other perceived obstacles that you see that might be preventing field data from achieving the success that you're seeking? No, I, I think if we were, if we're sitting in a, a strategy session trying to figure out how we expand further. Part of it is for us, um, you even said the, the concept of the founder system uh, or the founder syndrome, that legacy system. Uh, probably the biggest barrier that we have today would be a massive traditional brick and mortar system, legacy systems that are in place. And I'll give you a quick serve uh, restaurant example of mystery shopping. Uh, mystery shopping is uh, fairly fragmented. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are a few key players in the reporting side, but the actual providers are fragmented. And person A said, hey, I've been using, you know, Henry's Mystery Shopping for the last 25 years. I've been getting the same report every month for 25 years. And if I use you to do something different, 
then what do I do with 25 years worth of data and my trends? Mm. Well, that's really hard to push against. Mm. So every now and then you find a new person that comes into the job and says, yeah, I'm going to keep doing traditional, but I'm now going to take two or three insights from that traditional and I'm going to go use field agent to bring those insights to life and go make some major changes. So what we see from that is that legacy systems are sometimes really hard to get in. And I get it because people are protecting their turf and, and it is really good data. But in today's world, Henry, it's just not the right data. It, it's simply the speed is not there. Uh, there's nothing worse than hearing someone make a decision on 30 day old data or two week old data. Sure. I mean, today's world, Henry, the bus is gone. Yeah. I mean, it, it is out the gate, it is down the street, it's already made the turn, and you're making decisions. But then someone says, you're Rick, but you don't understand. I've been doing this for 10 years. I have to keep doing this because of the legacy. And Henry, those things are hard to break into. Sure, I understand completely. You're, you want to be able to use the data as soon as it's created. The longer you right. leave it alone, the greater the opportunities are for it to be in corrupted. Right. So, Right, right. And we see that in research as well. We, we talk about recall. We know recall at best is bad. If I ask you, you know, the, the last five places you shop for coffee and you tell me I went here and purchased coffee, I said, okay, can you tell me what flavor of Danish or muffin did they have in the window? And you're like, uh, blueberry. Because yeah. recall at, ba at best is bad, right? Now, you're not lying to me, but you're trying to, to give me some perspective. And this is just from yesterday or the day before. Yeah. And then I, then I come in and say, hey, while you're going to Starbucks, while you're going to local Onyx Coffee, while you're there, take a photo of the window that shows all the Danishes that are there. Tell me what flavors are there. And now I have truth. I've got a photo in the back end. Then I ask you the question, so Henry, when you purchased what you purchased, why did you purchase it? You're going to tell me, well, I was standing in line and the person next to me got a blueberry muffin. It looked really good. If I ask you from a recall standpoint, about purchase two weeks ago, you'd say, well, I was hungry. Yeah. See the difference in the insight? Sure. You're not telling me, you're not wrong that you chose it because you were hungry, but you know what's better is that you chose it because the person in front of you had it and it just looked good. Yeah. Those are the things we deliver and it's really hard to understand it until you start getting a flavor for this. And it's really, really cool to see someone's eyes when they get that level of insight. Yeah, or if it's the, the, the barista doing some upselling too. But absolutely, because they suggested it. You're like, oh my gosh, our training actually worked. You know, imagine that. Yeah. All right, Rick, would you please share a story of how you helped a client overcome these obstacles and succeed? Yeah, so we think of, you know, clients that are trying to, you know, figure out how to, you know, solve some problems. I'm going to give you kind of a marketing example. Um, you know, we had a client that was, uh, had a brand new product that was hard to understand. Uh, and they're really trying to get the average everyday person to try it, but it's really hard to try the product. It's hard to, to sample it. You can send samples out. Uh, so they came to us and said, do you think you could get five, 10,000 people, everyday people that could buy a product, try a product, and then share about their experience in a story format, and then take that information and then share it with their friends. And so imagine this, if you will, Henry, uh, we had literally thousands of people that purchased a hair color kit. They colored their hair, took a picture of it, told the story about their experience, and they shared it with their friends. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> they bought the product, they tried it, and it was hair color. They tried it, they shared it with their friends. They're like, oh my gosh, A, I didn't think you'd ever find that many people that would actually do that. Yeah. B, based on the locations, we have literally drawing circles around stores. I've got now two or three people around those stores and they're now sharing about that experience via social media. It really touched on everything that we're good at. One, it showed our scale. They could go to the store. The product was there. This was the price of the product. It was an audit. They actually tried it and gave them some research, told about it, told about the shopping experience. And then they wrote about it and then we shared it via our platform and then we shared it via social media. So, so it hit all facets to make that happen. Then that person comes back in and says, A, unbelievable, because we're making decisions based on 200 data points, not thousands. Mm -hmm. And you actually were able to make something happen so that we created this groundswell of everyday influencers. So it was a really, really fun story. It was fun for our team to be able to see how it could really come to life. So, what, so if you could just distill that down, what would you say is the moral of the story? 
Well, I, I think that the, the moral of the story for us in general, the type of data that we collect, um, is that the right piece of data and the right engagement really can be used to kind of uh, exponentially grow or use that piece of data across multiple facets. And so in a, in a simpler way to say that would be uh, a picture tells a thousand words, yes, but the type of data that we have can be used for four or five different things. So we kind of double dip. The moral of the story is you could have done an audit project, budget one. You could have done a research project, budget two. You could have done a customer experience project, budget three. And then you could have done some form of a buy and try marketing experience, budget four. I could have charged you 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000 for 40, or I could just charge you one time 10,000 dollars and you get four. They're like, oh my gosh, Rick. I can get more with less. And so that's the part that you begin to see with the module that we've laid out. One platform goes all the way across, left to right. That platform can hit facets, and you can be broad, or you can be finite and very, very targeted. And that's the moral of the story for folks. We're just not an audit company. We really do go from audit, data collection, all the way into the marketing and task world. And so that part's been pretty fun for, for our clients to see. Okay. So now you've been in business like about 10 years. You know, we have our 10 year uh, birthday coming up in April. Okay, cool. So the type of services you offer is kind of vulnerable to the cyber hackers, hackers out there. So what have you seen over the past 10 years? Is it getting worse for you or what? Yeah. So, so what happened, you know, you know Henry, you, some of this will be, near and dear to the heart of your listeners, some of them are going to cringe as I, I talk through it. But, but what happens in our world, because of the scale that we have, uh, and the quite honestly, the reputation that we have in the industry, uh, that we do have some scammers that are out there that are trying to use our reputation to say, hey, if you love field agent, and I know you can only make $5 per transaction or $10 per transaction, how would you like to make $300 or $1,000 this weekend? And then for someone that checks us out on the web and they have a friend that's using us like, oh my gosh, this is too good to be true, Henry. And you know what? It is. And it's, it's, it's scammers that are coming in trying to use our reputation to get people to do things. And it's one big scam. So it's been really, really unfortunate. So that's the first piece over here that's happening to everyday folks. We tell them we only work within our app. That's how we're going to engage you. That's how we're going to pay you. All the transactions are happening through this app. Uh, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Uh, the second thing is you think about folks coming in and really trying to game the system, if you will. Um, everyone thinks they're smarter than everyone else. It's like, you know, listen, Rick will never know. I'll do this transaction. I'll be sitting on my couch, and I'll take a photo of a picture on my computer. He'll never know I'm not in the store. Henry, I know you're not in the store. Or, hey, I'll go to this store, and I'll take the photo, and I'll pretend like I go to the other store but I'll just sit in my car and use the same photo. You no, know, that doesn't work either because you know what? I, it's the same shadow and it's the same. I mean, so the, the other, you have other individual scammers just trying to scam us by saying, I'm smarter than you. I'm going to manipulate the data. And you know what? We've, we've been there, done that. So there's two big pieces for the everyday person listening today, field agent, great company. We hold you really, really rigid to what we need for quality data. We're, we're up front with what we're looking for. We always engage in the app. Don't chase that shiny object. And for the individual that's playing with the data, and says, I'm completing this, don't think you're smarter than the other couple of hundred thousand people that try to do the same thing. Uh, we really do keep honest people on it. <coughs> so, so when you get the photographs, are you also looking at the GPS information on the photo? Uh, absolutely, and as you know, uh, you know GPS, uh, is, is only so good. And so there's a part of it that says, yeah, I know within a couple hundred feet or 60 feet where you are. Uh, so there's algorithms we use to ensure you're in the right location. But that's why photos are important mm -hmm. because now I need to, to make sure that you're inside the store standing in front of a specific aisle. Mm -hmm. And now I know that because of the photo that's being provided. So I know you're in the right location as opposed to 10 miles away. So GPS yeah. helps me. And then obviously time date stamp helps as well because there are times we ask people to go buy a pizza between four and six o'clock at night <laughs> and it's time date stamped at night Could you um, tell us, uh, spend a few moments now talking about the defining moment that you had in your life that inspired you to form field agent and get out of corporate America? 
Yeah, you know, I tell people we formed field agent pre-selfie. So how about that, Henry? You know, before there was a front-facing camera, no video on the phone. These are back the olden days of smartphones. But I'm going to take you back about 10 years prior to that. I was working for Procter & Gamble uh, in corporate America, and I'd been there about 16 years, going 17, was uh, uh, living in Asia at the time, really trying to decide, do I stay within corporate America and, and pursue that career and have a, a long-term career within, uh, in this case, Procter & Gamble, uh, or do I kind of go out on my own uh, and, and give it a shot and see what it looks like? And I was at that pivotal moment, and so do I make this call or do I stay? <laughs> I, made the decision to, to, I made the decision to go out and give it a shot. Uh, and so I left P&G at that time, came to Northwest Arkansas, this really interesting retail hub uh, near this little company called Walmart, and started doing shopper marketing, shopper research work. Yeah, from that, you begin to understand that as you start mining data and look at marketing pieces, uh, you know, research and, and understanding what consumers wanted, and shoppers wanted, really was key. And that takes us all the way to 2009 when this little smartphone came out. And if any, well, you think about it, iPhone 3S. 1.2 megapixel picture, you had no video, no front facing camera, but man, it was cool. Yeah. And we ask ourselves the questions, you know, it really was that, was anyone using this phone to capture data? And we found out it wasn't. The business model at that time, the first year or so of the smartphone, was to get downloads, have someone click on an ad. Downloads, click on an ad. And so we ask ourselves the simple question, could we get everyday people to use that phone or that camera in their pocket to capture data, Henry, the answer was yes. And so we launched, we had the first app on iTunes to pay cash, uh, the first app to use geolocation, pull data back in, uh, and then really didn't turn our heads after that, and just lowered our head and went down this field agent route. But the corporate America change was key for, uh, for me to make the decision to jump into the entrepreneurial world. Wonderful. Okay, so on a similar vein, uh, would you please share an experience you had early on in life that still influences how you approach business today. You know, you know, everyone has a saying from their dad or someone you know that kind of kind of sticks with you. And um, whether I'm talking to an entrepreneur or I'm talking to a client, uh, I'm speaking from the stage, uh, the theme of my conversation, especially for the startup folks or the people who are interested in doing something on their own, is a simple phrase that says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Stay out of the world of maybe. I mean, maybes are terrible. They're terrible. There's nothing worse than going in to try to sell someone. Hey, are you interested in this thing called field agent? I share it. It says, well, maybe. I'm like, oh, no, just say no. Well, maybe. We'll say yes. Well, maybe. Maybes are terrible. Do everyone a favor in your life, say no. Yeah. Let them move on. Or say, no, not now. Come see me in three years. Maybe, but maybes are terrible. Hmm. Uh, I meet entrepreneur types all the time. Says, Man, I've got 10 ideas. I've got 10 separate folders. And I'm thinking about them. Which one are you going to do? I don't know. What about this one? Maybe that one. Maybe this one. Oh my gosh! You know, you, you you've got to move on. And what I found in life is that the deselection process of saying no is a very healthy thing. And the deselection process of maybes are healthy. And you're going to find, you know, I'm a bell curve guy. You're going to find that top one or two ideas. You know it. Your friends know it. You know it intuitively. Make a decision and move on. It, it'll be life changing for you. And sometimes. People that we talk to, Henry, just need that little nudge to say yes or no. Yeah. Well, that's also kind of going with the Pareto principle. 20% of your ideas are going to generate 80% of your income. And someone says, maybe, but for you, but maybe for me, it's more like 50, 50. I mean, you're like, no, you're not. There's no maybe. It's an 80-20. Yeah. Okay. So what does success look like for Rick West? Wow. Success for me. Uh, let's talk about success as Rick West, the person here for a second. Forget about field agent, how things play out. Uh, I'm a person of faith, and so that's important for me. Uh, and so the, the Jewish carpenter that I work for, that, that concept that I'm driving home every single day says, uh, how can I help people around me? Uh, and so whether it be my grandkids over here, my neighbor next to me, or an entrepreneur down the street, uh, if, if I wake up in the morning and in some way I can give back at work or give back in some way, that's really what's driving me every single day. Uh, as I look at it from a CEO standpoint, the guy that's playing this role within Field Agent today, uh, it's somewhat of a legacy, but it, it's leaving behind a business that's sustainable, one that can grow and will actually have an impact and a footprint in this community we live in, as well as the globe uh, for years to come. And if I can do that with my neighbors, and my kids and my grandkids, 
and I can do that here and be able to give back in some way, uh, then I've done okay. And my dad looking down at me would say, you know what, you've done pretty well. Share some measurable outcomes that field agent has achieved. Yeah, so think of measures for our clients and measures for us as well. You know, we, we can look at downloads and downloads are somewhat misleading. If you've ever downloaded the app and deleted it, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but, we, but we look at it from an agent standpoint, how can we get more individuals engaged with our app and more importantly, the individuals that are engaged be able to do more work? Uh, and that's the scale that we're really driving right now. So while we've got 1.5 million downloads, uh, it's our objective to get more people engaged day in and day out. And so that's a measurable thing that we're tracking every single day to make sure that happens. And this month, it's the tens of thousands of people getting paid and hundreds of thousands of people that are engaged. But those are all great attributes and things that we're measuring. Um, if you look at success over here from a client standpoint, uh, it's all about having someone come back. And, and we're proud to say that if you use this today, you're going to use this tomorrow. Uh, now, we're, we're, uh, we're also the type of company that people call us with an emergency. Hey, I'm panicking. Can you help me? Because of the pricing example we gave earlier. Uh, so that's another key thing that we're focused on today is how do we be a part of the solution for our clients so it's longevity as opposed to a transactional nature. So that's really, really important for us to, to go down that path. And then in the middle, as you look at our, our team and what we're trying to do here, um, people leave our company because they want to do something bigger and better. And we support them and we help them find those roles. Uh, and so if we can keep the right culture and community here and things happening and people only leave for something bigger and better then we've done something right here uh, so we have tremendously low turnover uh, we have virtually no regrettable loss because we're coming alongside an individual saying hey i get it henry if you want to go do something different let us be a part of that and surprise surprise we've had a handful of people come back in three or four years and come back and work for us again after they've gone out and get a taste of this and they come back in the other direction so those are kind of three things that we're measuring to make sure that we're on top of. Okay, great. Yes, <clears throat> so you got several different dimensions to look at. Okay, so from a CEO's perspective, what are your top three business capability challenges or concerns? Yeah, I think the, the first one for us is the, the conversation we had earlier about that data piece. How do you mine more data out of a, out of a photo or, or a piece of information? And there, there's so many, um, that's what I'm looking for. There's so many, so many shiny objects saying we can do this, we can do that. Uh, so we've got to get a handle on the right partner or the right piece of technology that lets us mine that data in a certain way. So we've got smart people looking at that, which makes sense. I think the other piece for us is, uh, and we joke about it all the time, uh, we have people that want to do good work for us, uh, but when you get down to zero unemployment, hmm. You know, there are people that really, you know, want to go, go do work. So, you know, five, six years ago, it was amazing how many people were begging us, hey, give me anything to do. I'll go do it tomorrow. When you're down to 3% unemployment, you know, less than that in other markets, uh, it's a little bit of a different dynamic for us. So we're spending as much time, if not more, really making sure that people that want to do this type of work as a fun extra piece of income that we're taking care of them. And so the economy changes. And so we've got to be on top of that. Uh, I think the other facet for us is you look at clients coming into us, uh, and it's sort of tied to the cybersecurity thing we talked about earlier. Um, you have lookalike companies that come in that say, I can do what field agent does. They don't have the 10 years experience. They don't understand how things work. But they say, yeah, but I can go do this for, you know, three cents on the dollar because I've raised some funding and I'm coming in. And so what I have to tell people, Henry, is that I fix $3 haircuts. Uh, yeah. You get the $3 haircut, you go home, and here your wife's like, woof, that's pretty rough. You know what? I'm not a $50 haircut, but I'm a solid eight. Yeah. So for eight or $10, I can take care of that. So the other concern I have is that they aren't necessarily bad players, but people will buy their way into this business, do a bad job, and it sours the entire pot because of that. Is that kind of one bad apple piece? Right. So we have to be watching out for that. But, but again, I tell people, I fix $3 haircuts. Go ahead and try it one time. It'll be miserable. You'll feel good one time and you realize how bad it was. Yeah. Yeah, that reminds me as a friend of mine, another podcast guest was telling me that <clears throat> growing up in East Texas, there was one barber shop in this town. And somebody then opened up a salon, a salon there and they were given cheap haircuts. And 
he didn't drive his price down. He's, he put his sign in. I fixed, I fixed the $5 haircuts. And, and, and it's so true because, again, you, let's say that you have a startup and somebody gives you $5, $10 million. Well, how do you get volume? You go in and say, well, if your agent charges 10 or 20, I'll do it for three or four. Mm-hmm. And they're like, wow. I'm at, literally, I have one client tell me, we, we were doing an RFP, and I, I, I went to the headquarters, did the pitch. We finished the pitch. He pulled me inside and said, Rick, you're the only guy today that knows what he's talking about. Mm-hmm. And he said, it's fair price, but i got to be honest with you. This guy that it met it was like two, three hours ago, he's going to do this for literally 30 cents on the dollar. Do you charge me 10? He's going to charge me three. I know it's not going to be great, but I'd be crazy not to go do this. And I'll milk it for about 18 months and I'll call you back. Well, in about 18 months, he called me back. He said, well, they had to raise their prices. Their data was terrible. Now I want to talk to you. Hmm. And so that's really frustrating. But I understand from a budget standpoint, if you're in purchasing, you're doing an RFP, you think this is a commodity, but it's not necessarily a commodity. You have to know what you're doing. Sure. So what's the most important question your customers should be asking you when they consider using field agent for the services? Uh, I think a lot of the why. Uh, at, at times they'll look at this as a commodity. Well, your piece of data is like any other piece of data. Uh, our point is, is that we do a really good job of asking the question, why do you want that piece of data? And if they're smart, and I tell people, if you're interviewing three companies like mine, don't go down the price route and say, can you go do these three things? You need to ask the question, how would you go do that? And why did you do it a certain way? And when you get into the hows and the whys, we're going to shine. Our experience, the scale of which we've done things, and the fact that I can tell you methodology to go get X uh, is breathtaking sometimes. My team's amazing at how they've done methodology. But if you just want to put a piece of data on a spreadsheet and say, what are you going to charge for this? You're asking the wrong questions. And to be honest with you, I'm probably not the, the right solution for you. Yeah, it's really hard to get people to get beyond that price consideration. That's always the wrong criteria to use when evaluating multiple companies. But that's the best the really is. one thing that they use all the time. Well, go go for the low ball. Right, right. Okay. So the other thing is, um, well, yeah, you know, what's the most important thing your customers should be asking or considering when they evaluate you against your competition? I mean. We talked about price, you talked about methods. Is there anything else that they should be looking at? Uh, I think it's the quality control on the back end. Um, you know, we have amazing metrics that we can show them from a quality standpoint. A, how many people are doing pieces of work, how many of those uh, individuals we have to reject based on quality, what the quality looks on the back end. Uh, if, if, if you've got a, you know, a specific organization that they're engaging with and they can't walk them through, in our case, we have, I think, 13 checkpoints, right? they can't walk you through those 13 checkpoints and give you KPIs for those, then it's probably not a company that you want to engage in to have an API with data going into your system. But if you want a real cheap answer tomorrow and you're not really, you don't really care, you just want to have some idea, then go with the cheap guy over there. But if you want to make a business decision and you're going to make changes to third parties, 3PLs, and you're really going to engage someone and try to make a business decision, they better understand quality on the back end. And, and that's where we're going to excel. Okay. All right. So now, uh, the, um, thinking about the business and when you started, if you had to start field agent all over again from scratch today, uh, what would you do different and what would you t- keep doing the same? Well, the one thing that we started that was really interesting that we would keep doing um, is that we put processes in place and built an infrastructure that we started out nationwide every single zip code day one. We didn't start out with one market and move to a second one. Uh, a, that showed the scale and the, the, um, the audacity that we had to go do that. Kept a lot of competitors out because like how on earth would these guys go do that? Uh, I think the other piece is, and, and again, it, it, hindsight's always better, right? You can look back and say, gosh, Rick, why didn't you go make this happen? Um, we stayed fairly rigid with audits for a period of time before we jumped into research, mystery shopping, et cetera, I probably would have accelerated that. And that's me with hindsight looking at it uh, because you have to be really careful when you get into representative samples and national samples and what you can really do and kind of building it up. So I probably uh, would have tried to figure out a little bit faster path to go left to right on that scale from a platform standpoint, do that a little bit different. Uh, And again, to be honest with you, as you look at the way we scaled the type of work and the infrastructure that we have today. Um, 
I think the tech thing made sense, the operations thing made sense. Uh, we probably uh, would have leaned a little bit more towards some of the AI type of work earlier on, even though it was pretty painful. And again, this is pre-selfie. I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to say that today, but 2010, there weren't a bunch of people sitting around with all these algorithms and thought processes of how you would collect all these pieces of data. Big data was, it wasn't even talked about. Mm -hmm. But if I was starting all over again today, I probably would have spent a little bit more time on that on the front end, which would have helped me operationally. But it's hard to say with hindsight. Sure. I mean, the thing is that you, you have to go down that path anyhow. Right. To learn those things. Right. Yeah. So um, we could keep going on and on and on here. We're rapidly yeah. running out of time. And I want to be respectful of your uh, time this morning, Rick. So how can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more about field agent or even more about the entrepreneurial things you went through? You know, believe it or not, I'm brave enough to give you my email address because most people could figure it out anyway. But, you know, just send me an email. It's rick.west at fieldagent.net. If you don't want to talk to me, even though you like me a lot, you don't want to talk to me, uh, if you sent the exact same thing at sales at fieldagent.net, obviously someone could go talk to you. So I'm a great person to engage. You can catch me on LinkedIn as well. We can engage back and forth there. So we'd love to spend time with your listeners, readers coming in. And I've got an amazing sales team, business development team here uh, that would love to kind of walk through truly our capabilities and what we can do. And guess what, Henry? A yes and no guy. If I can't help you, I'll actually say no. Yeah. Crazy, I know. I'll no actually tell a client, we can't help them. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Okay, Rick, this is, I've been just fascinated by everything you've been talking about today, and I really appreciate it. And I like your whole philosophy and advice about there are no maybes, it's either yes or no. So I'm sure our viewership will find this just as fascinating as I do. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Listen, Henry, thanks for having me on. And Alyssa, I appreciate the time you gave me today. Have a great day. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the Business Performance Podcast with your business coach, Henry Schneider. For more episodes and business strategies, please visit welcome.ppqc.net backslash blog. That's www.welcome.ppqc.net backslash blog. And remember to subscribe so you can get the latest episodes. Thank you. Thank you.